So the problem now is that we live in this sort of ahistorical mindset today where everything is about China, China, China. You know, and some people probably expected me to write a book called The Future is China. But I didn't. The book is called The Future is Asia. <laughs> because there are 5 billion people, as I said earlier, in Asia, only uh, 1.5 billion of whom are Chinese. That leaves several billion who are not Chinese, uh, by my arithmetic. Some of the fastest growing countries in the world are in that stretch of countries, whether it's um, uh, you know, Bangladesh uh, and, and others. And you see a lot of investment now being diverted from China, given the lower wages, into, into this stretch of countries. So if you take South and Southeast Asia, the two and a half billion people, and if they grow at 5%, if their economies grow at only 5%, mind you, India is growing faster than that already, but then they will equal China's present GDP in just 10 years. One of my favorite lines from the book is uh, in Barak's own words. He says, if the 19th century featured the Europeanization of the world and the 20th century the Americanization, then the 21st century is the time of Asianization. And citing developments from China's Belt and Road Initiative, which he regaled us about, which he called the most significant diplomatic project of the 21st century. The Asianization of Asia, as I call it, is uh, a process that again began in the 1990s with the super cycle. It's found its way through the trade integration um, of the post-Asian financial crisis period, such that by the time of 2008, the, uh, the financial crisis that emanated out of New York, again, there was already a sufficient integration that there was resilience to the demand shocks of the financial crisis. And then th beyond that, uh, more uh, financial and trade integration has taken place and now you have the final piece of the puzzle which is the sort of Belt and Road Initiative and the infrastructural integration that not only brings Asians closer together but brings Europe into the into the fold so you have a process of decoupling as you would call it um, not just Asian decoupling but perhaps Eurasian decoupling Number one was a preference for technocratic forms of governance, even in the democracies. There is a, a, a deference towards uh, executive authority, you know, with long-term mandates, if you will, around national leadership, reform, and, and, and so forth. More so than there is in the West, obviously, where governments change every five minutes. The second was a uh, mixed capitalism, right? Obviously, a tolerance, if not a preference, again, for a strong role for the state in the economy, whether it's uh, through industrial uh, policies, sub you know, subsidies, and other kinds of supports uh, for critical industries, picking winners, managed innovation, whatever the case uh, may be. And the third was what I call uh, social conservatism. There is a, you know, a growing sense of liberty and freedom, but a caution towards how rapidly that's in implemented uh, across the spectrum of issues, whether it is media freedom or LGBT rights or whatever the case may be. There's a sense that people will say, yes, it's okay if we do those things, I suppose, but let's have it be done in an incremental and somewhat managed way so that things don't get out of control. Asia's natural state, given the richness and diversity of its civilizations, is multipolarity um, and, and, in a way, a, a respectful autonomy um, uh, across the vast distances uh, of Asia. A lot of people characterize China as an unstoppable force, and I believe that Asia is full of immovable objects, in a way. And I think that what we will find, ultimately, is an equilibrium. And Asia, again, most of Asian history is the history, a story, if you will, of equilibrium among these great uh, uh, civilizations, and I expect that to continue.